I find the history of mathematics pretty darn fascinating, wrapped up in all these numbers and theorems and famous names attached to infamous results, there are a host of fascinating stories, and I think one of the most interesting ways to consume some of the history of math is through the history of the mathematicians, and this is one of the great books on just that subject, Men of Mathematics. I haven't had a ton of time and opportunity to read books on math history, but this is one of the books that I've read in its entirety, although one of the nice things about this book is that you can just pick a section you're interested in, jump in and jump out. That's a pretty big book coming in at what, a little over, about 600 pages, um, but it is a great read. This is Men of Mathematics, the lives and achievements of the great mathematicians from Zeno to Poincaré. I just looked up that pronunciation. It's something like that, at least for someone who doesn't want to go hard on the French pronunciation, uh, by E.T. Bell. That's Eric Temple Bell, if I recall correctly. I actually read a lot of this book while I was at a family reunion at the Poland Springs Resort in Maine, and so I just have memories of being kind of holed up in this old house that was just like on the resort and we rented, you know, chipping paint and old wooden floorboards and just reading this book. It was really a vibe and I was really enjoying myself uh, since I had this great book to keep me entertained from socializing with people who I guess I knew but perhaps hadn't seen in some number of decades. It's, uh, it's a great book though. The, um, it's paperback here and I like that. It's a little easier to transport and to just flip through casually. If this was hardcover, it would just be a little bit more difficult to take with you wherever you're going and to just kind of, you know, flip it open if you're walking around or standing around. You know, paperback's just a little more manageable. But you can see it's got a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of bending and creasing going on as it's been somewhat well-loved throughout the years. I, I enjoy returning to this book now and again um, to read just some of the interesting sections. Every section is on a different mathematician. Let's take a look at the table of contents and you can see all of the mathematicians that this great book covers. It of course has an introduction before it gets into any of the mathematicians. Um, and a little rundown here, what's it say? For the reader's comfort, the beginning of modern mathematics. Are mathematicians human? Witless parodies, a limitable scope of mathematical evolution, pioneers and scouts. Huh, I, I honestly don't even remember what these blurbs are. What's this talking about? Modern minds and ancient bodies. Um, in this section, they actually cover some ancient um, mathematicians, a few of them in one section. For most of the book, it's one mathematician per section, but you know, some of the ancient fellows who we have less information about it makes sense to cover them in their own section. Modern ancients and ancient moderns, Pythagoras, great mystic, greater mathematician, proof or intuition, the taproot of modern analysis. So it's just giving you like a, a really um, kind of casual listing of the sort of things you can expect in the section. The first mathematician to get a full section in the book is Descartes. There's some, I mean, you know, what's going to stick with you if you read this book is just some of the fascinating stories. And if you look up books about mathematicians and you look up this book specifically, you'll find some, um, you know, some people criticizing the book as there are stories in here that are really just presented as true that I think the historical record shows are probably not true, um, but you know, they became popular stories about whatever mathematician they might relate to. And uh, there was one story about Descartes where somebody was trying to threaten him. He had like somebody giving him a, uh, a ride on a boat across some body of water and uh, they, they were trying to threaten him for money or something and Descartes pulled out a sword and said, no, you're taking me exactly where I want to go. That's what's going to happen. And that was a great story. Really stuck with me and I can't remember enough of the details to do it justice. Then we get Fermat and I love that it has all of these nicknames too. The Prince of Amateurs. Really interesting guy. Then we have Pascal. Then Newton. After Newton, fittingly, we have Leibniz, the master of all trades, on page 117. I, I would say this book overall does a great job, too, of separating the biographical details from the mathematics. So if you're not really into reading into some of the nitty gritty details of the math, then you can just enjoy the stories and the biography. Um, 
but the book does a great job of giving you, you know, a casual introduction of some of the mathematics, um, as well as the biographical details. And it's nice that you can read them both, or you can focus on just one. Of course, a lot of the math involved here is pretty complicated, um, and this book definitely doesn't go into too uh, much deep detail. So, you know, if you're an undergrad math major, it's uh, mostly all comprehensible, and really makes for a fun and satisfying read to get this combination of story and mathematics. Final handful of sections here, just scrolling through so you can see, got a section on Boole, Kronecker, Riemann, The Last Universalist, Poincaré, Paradise Lost with Cantor, and of course his infinite sets. A lot of interesting stories, a lot of interesting characters, um, a lot of interesting mathematics in this book. In the acknowledgments, you can learn where E.T. Bell got the information for this book. He says, Without a mass of footnotes, it would be impossible to cite authority for every statement of historical fact in the following pages. But little of the material consulted is available outside of large university libraries, and most of it is in foreign languages. For the principal dates and leading facts in the life of a particular man, I have consulted the obituary notices of the moderns. These are found in the proceedings of the learned societies of which the man in question was a member. Other details of interest are given in the correspondence between mathematicians and in their collected works. In addition to the few specific sources cited presently, bibliographies and references in the following have been especially helpful. And he goes into detail into some more of the sources. Also have a little bit of info about E.T. Bell on the back of the book. I'm not sure how well the camera can see this black on purple, um, but he lived from 1883 to 1960. So this is a pretty old book. I mean, you saw how it stopped at Cantor. He was for many years professor of mathematics at the California Institute of Technology, president of the Mathematical Association of America, vice president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a member of the National Academy of Science. Published 12 books. I haven't read any of his others, but I'll definitely have to check out his bibliography. Of course, one of the very famous stories of mathematicians is the story of Galois and his passing. His section is titled Genius and Stupidity. Just for an example, let's check out this section and uh, see if we can find the thrilling part of his story, the tragic part. Just looking at the opening of the section on Galois is just a great example of how compelling the writing is in this book. Abel was done to death by poverty, Galois by stupidity. In all the history of science, there is no completer example of the triumph of crass stupidity over untamable genius than is afforded by the all too brief life of Everest Galois. And keep in mind, E.T. Bell is not saying here that Galois was undone by his own stupidity, but in fact, he beat his life out, fighting one unconquerable fool after another. This is the stupidity of others um, that was his undoing. To make a long story very short, Galois ended up having a duel scheduled on his calendar, the nature of which is not known for sure, but there is a lot of speculation that it may have had something to do with a broken love affair. In the end, he spent his last night scribbling out letters and mathematics, his final words, and this is what E.T. Bell says about that final day. At a very early hour, on the 30th of May, 1832, Galois confronted his adversary on the field of honor. The duel was with pistols at 25 paces. Galois fell, shot through the intestines. No surgeon was present. He was left lying where he had fallen. At nine o'clock, a passing peasant took him to the Cochin hospital. Galois knew he was about to die. Before the inevitable peronit per peritonitis set in, and while still in the full possession of his faculties, he refused the offices of a priest. Perhaps he remembered his father, his young brother, the only one of his family who had been warned, arrived in tears. Galois tried to comfort him with a show of stoicism. Don't cry, he said. I need all my courage to die at twenty. Tragic story indeed, but well told in this classic text. <laughs> 